did have a job was that it mentioned that speaking to one of the clients, um, and it was an hour, at least three times a week. I couldn't speak to any less than an hour. I was contractually obliged to speak to them for an hour. So keeping to 20 minutes is my personal challenge today. Um, also, I recognize there's a massive experience in the room. Um, how much, in terms of housing experience, I'm not sure, but there's a massive experience about the planning system and whether you feel the planning system is doing the right thing. Um, yesterday, Alex Niels uh, challenged Robert Black, who, who published, the author of uh, Shelter Commission for Housing and Wellbeing, uh, by saying there isn't a housing crisis. So that's Alex Neal's current view. There isn't a housing crisis out there. Robert Black saying there is. So you, have, you do have contrasting views. Um, my take is if you are in a house uh, you own um, without a mortgage um, uh, and in a well-paying job, uh, you're probably sitting thinking, I'm fine, there is no crisis here whatsoever. Um, and in fact, I have a nest egg. Um, if you're young, um, and if anything up to mid thirties, um, if, definitely if you're on a waiting list, and there's 170,000 people in Scotland on that waiting list, um, if you've been threatened with or are experiencing homelessness, um, if you're an older person in infirm, in uh, living in a house that's crumbling around you, um, you have all of those people are in some stage uh, faced with a severe problem. Uh, some might be recognize that as a crisis. What I think, though, is that for generations we've not been building enough houses, so we have a chronic situation of undersupply of housing. Now, this is against the backdrop. I'm going to run through a few slides. I'll try and cover very, very quickly what, what the overarching housing strategy is in the country. Performance on new supply, much of which is familiar to you, I hope. The system we currently got and why we think it's not working. Uh, what's now being launched just yesterday, in fact, or no, last week in fact, a new joint housing delivery plan. And I'll highlight where HOPs have a lead responsibility on some of the actions and a few of my own conclusions. And that is, by the way of Stark, the main strands of our housing strategy. So since 2011, homes fit for the 21st century, 2013, age, home and community, sustainable housing strategy, and the last one, place to call home, which is all about growing the private rented sector. Every one of those documents sets out really ambitious targets. Um, and broadly regarded as really strong in terms of their social objectives. And they are the backdrop, that's the plank against which uh, the current government believes um, uh, how, to, how to frame the, the country's strategy. In the last couple of years though, uh, and since 2013, um, and it started with uh, the Homes, the Housing in Scotland, Audit Scotland report, um, that was published in 2013. Um, these four critiques uh, or observations have come up with collectively an account of, and adding in the 47 from yesterday's published commission. There are 79 recommendations out there saying the system isn't working as it should and it needs to be improved. So we're not short of critique um, or recognizing that there are still significant problems. Um, uh, Rick's been, the Rick's uh, report has been with us now for a year. It was kind of parked and got in the way of the evolution debate. It will get picked up, I'm sure, because the government is saying it's committed to looking at part five of the land in Scotland, the Land Reform Review Group, which is the key, um, I think, the best critique and observation we've had in years about some of the underlying problems of housing supply and the link with um, the planning system. Um, the, uh, the telling point from the Audit Scotland's report, though, and I quote, at current building rates, it would take 40 years before we have enough new homes to meet the needs. And so they were the, that, was, that was the first occasion that the government was, if it was totally complacent about having the right strategy in place, it was certainly shaken out of that complacency a couple of years ago. 
Um, a few slides on the, the evidence. This is the facts on new supply. Again, this might be all very familiar stuff to you. <coughs> Under the national performance purpose targets, one of them relates to um, housing, increasing the number of new homes. And what you can see there is a pretty steady decline in the last 10 years. A small evidence of recovery. Um, peaking, not getting to 30,000, getting over 25,000, this is all housing types, um, uh, but down to about 15,000. That's quite an important figure to keep in your head at the moment. Um, and completions, which I think is the, the, the key measure here. Um, start to completion, the completions figure falling, coming up a little bit again in 14. There's a little bit more evidence in 2015 yet to be finally published. Um, this, however, um, is against varying takes of need. Um, so, for a number of years, people have been using the, the number of 30,000. Uh, of all house types, this is what the country needs for a sustained period. Um, the Commission report yesterday settled on 23,000 as the figure, but as an interim statement to 2020. Um, because we, and I'll come to the point in a minute, we've got significant household growth projections going on and, 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 and household formation rates increasing as well. And private sector performance has clearly fallen through the floor with the recession. Um, again, small bits of recovery. This recovery, many are pointing to the Help to Buy programme, which is a, what's called a demand side subsidy. It's, it's questionable as to how much new supply is coming through that program. And there is anxiety that if you, if you rely too heavily on demand side subsidy, um, it simply inflates the price, making it that bit more difficult for the next cohort below, um, the next economic cohort below, to afford what they need. Um, this is the performance of RSLs, housing associations and local authorities. And uh, interestingly, housing associations have a habit of bucking the trend. They can, they can be counter-cyclical. Um, it's part of the way in which government subsidy has applied to the programme. So you've seen in the last uh, 10 years, the programme going up, down and up again. Uh, should I say down, up and down again? Uh, because we've seen in the last three or four years significant reduction a small increase in individuals in specific subsidy per unit. The financial capacity is a problem, and I'll come back and say a few more words about that in a minute. The green line at the bottom is the beginning of a uh, local authority build program since the 1980s, since the early Thatcher years. Local authorities being constrained, um, uh, building. They now, they now, under prudential discipline, as you know, have the opportunity, whether they can afford it, but they have the opportunity to start building themselves and we're beginning to see a little bit of that. But not without subsidy, I have to say. Not only are they putting in their own land, but they also generally require um, capital subsidy as well. Oh. How do I get back onto the And the outturn over the last few years. Um, blue is social rent, and you'll see that that has fallen quite significantly uh, over the last five, six years, uh, down to a level just above 3,000 units a year. And again, the Commission report yesterday recommended that should be 9,000 a year. Um, you've got the emerging new, what's the, the term affordable rent, and that's broadly understood as mid-market <coughs> So in parts of Scotland, not all, where there's a significant daylight between a social rent value and an open market rent value, there is there's this new market of uh, or cohort of population who are at average income or just below average income, in work, not reliant on benefit, can't get a house, uh, can't get on the waiting list, um, and can't get can't get mortgage. So this is a growing group. And there is substantial evidence of huge demand for this mid-rent product uh, in places like Edinburgh, Aberdeen, indeed in Perth, uh, parts of Dundee, parts of Glasgow. But it's 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 quite patchy. It's not it's not something that's applicable across the whole all of the country. Again, it generally needs subsidy. Um, uh, if you want to maintain that house 
for a long period. If, if, you're, if you're happy to go with the National Housing Trust model, and that is it needs to be put back into the private market between five and ten years, then you can progress it without a subsidy. Um, so there's lots of issues around subsidy, as I'm, as I'm highlighting here. Um, this was called, this was on in Scotland's take on the problem in Scotland. It's overly complex, growing specifically high and growing levels of need, complexity of funding arrangements. Um, there, was lit, there is little robust evidence of um, alternative funding routes to the, to the one which housing associations have been used to, and that is mixed three quarters uh, subs capital subsidy, a quarter of private finance. Not a lot of alternatives yet. People are still beavering away on bond finance, um, refinancing in different creative ways. But um, that's all about different takes on risk as well. So it, it is complex. Um, planning, the, the, the other critique um, of what Scotland was, planning for housing at a local level is overly complex. Um, the government, I have to say, thinks that the Honda process, housing uh, needs and uh, housing need and demand assessments, um, is an open and robust one, having just issued new guidance. I have to say there's, there's quite still, still quite strong differences of opinion about whether the, the figures that are in Hondas and the figures that find themselves in uh, effective supply statements, how that all ties up is not as transparent as it should be. Um, so that's, that's, just, that's just out there at the moment. Um, this is my, well, working within the, the Institute of Housing, our general take about um, the current housing system issues that we need to address. As I said, it works for some, but it is a crisis for large and growing numbers. Um, planners are the gatekeepers to the markets whether you can go to work in the morning thinking that, um, whether, you, whether that's, that's a high, high in your mind or whether that's somewhere out there for somebody else to worry about. Um, it is a fact though, um, the cost of restricting housing supply means higher prices for everyone, um, whether it's owner occupation or renting in varying ways. And the thing that really strikes me about how perverse our system is, is that for the very same house type, built in exactly the same way, um, it can cost 80% different, it can be, it, the value of it could be 80% uh, different, depending on where it's located. And that disparity, I believe, interferes with the desirable outcome that we have for a country, and that is connecting people and jobs, uh, housing and jobs, um, where people want to work and where, and where people want to live without unnecessary commuting behaviours um, and unsustainable um, commuting behaviour. An effective, flexible housing system reduces the volatility of the house price to buy and rent. And probably it's the price of land which is the absolute key variable here. Cost of construction is fairly fixed. We are looking, the industry continues to look at modern methods of construction and there are very interesting ideas um, coming out, which does in some ways reduce the price. But if you want to maintain quality, if you want to ensure that this house is fit for 100 years, which is what it probably has to stand up for, then compromising on quality is not acceptable. So the, the variable is land supply. I believe there are two things, unless you've not already read them. Read part five of the Land Reform Review Group support and read this little book here. It's Kate Barker, um, who is a very, very clever lady, woman, who did a huge study for the UK government about five years ago on housing supply. This is a crisp, short, takes two hours to read. You just have to go to the last chapter. I would thoroughly recommend. It, it's a UK take, but it's, it's got lots of resonating points uh, about the housing system. And just about where the planner can maybe exert an influence a bit more creatively. From the point of view of the CIH, this is the housing system that we need, something that works for everyone. 
And uh, so we need to address the supply issue. We need to ensure there's a strong understanding of affordability. It's a slippery, slippery term. Um, but we also know that the connection with the benefit regime, which we've not been in control and charge of, there's a possibility of Scotland becoming having more influence over that in the coming in the coming with the, with the uh, forthcoming Scotland Bill. And that we all know that uh, people's sense of what it's, what it's like to live here is so much more than just the bricks and mortar, it's the quality of the spaces and life opportunities around the back of the hall and connections. So organizations, delivery organizations which are focused on housing plus to sustain independent living is key. So that's what we need. Um, this is some key points about need and demand over the next generation in Scotland. Uh, so we need, we think, uh, to cater for 330,000 new households over the next 25 years. Um, that equates quite neatly to 30,000 new homes a year. Um, for a sustained period, and what I believe to be a sustained period is 20 years. So it's not just about five years, let's have another five year government promise. We need to have a generational commitment to address this. Uh, and not pretend that it can be solved in five or ten years, that's the other thing. Um, a third of which should be in that affordable category of social rent and mid rent, mid um, sub market. Um, 39% of households, according to the existing home alliance, um, uh, are experiencing fuel poverty. A staggeringly large number of people are experiencing this problem. So much is a uh, 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 product of prices, uh, or energy prices, which are out of control. But what is in our control is retrofitting our current stock. Um, and it's great to see here moves that it will become, I believe, the national infrastructure plan to address uh, poor quality. Most of the poor quality in this country resides in the private rented sector. Most of social housing has delivered uh, the social housing quality standard by, by this year. We also have a, an energy, energy efficiency standard to deliver on by 2020. The key problem lies in the quality of the private rented sector. We've got this demographic growth of 75 year olds plus currently 13% to become 20% of the total population in 20 years' time. And the pandemic in all of that, according to some of the health, um, health experts, is very forms of dementia and how to support people independently in that experience. Um, the joint delivery plan has come about, uh, well worth the read if you can plow through 34 actions, but it's come about from a conversation with the Minister, senior civil servants, and about 30 organisations around the table, including RTPI, um, and Homes for Scotland, and various others. Um, what, 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 there was a big conference in Murrayfield, 400 people turned up, slightly chaotic, very difficult to structure, but what, what's come from that is a commitment to say, yes, we will work more in a corporate Juiced sort of way, so it's not just about government must do this and that. It's trying to highlight where others can take responsibility and the lead. Um, it was published just the other week, last week, um, with two main themes: home and place, and this supply investment and planning in 13 of these 34 actions are related to that. So it's mainly the home and place ones which would interest yourselves in your working life, but there's a whole pile of other stuff around support to and maintain people's ability to live independently. And the planning ones, there's two ones for HOPs to take the lead on, actually for a, de a desired outcome is to increase the pace of supply through infrastructure investment. Um, improved communication um, uh, between this very complicated range of infrastructure agencies. And at what level are we talking about here? Are we talking at a government level, a local authority level, or even at a, at a more localised neighbourhood level, that's not clear. However, these are two actions which I, I hope you've had time to read. Um, yes, more homes delivered by small to medium sized enterprises. The recession killed off vast numbers of small businesses. So we are now dangerously left in the hands of far too few builders and, and private developers. And there's always danger of cartel behaviour as a result of that. 
So really working and building up that small business interest um, to make it a much more balanced and, and flexible supply. I'm trying to get hold of a brick these days and two years supply for bricks. Um, this is a serious problem. Scotland no longer produces its own bricks. Can we do something about that? I'm not sure, but we should. Um, three actions to support the delivery of. So there's going to be various teams um, pulled together. These are about um, improving development planning. Where have you heard that before? Modernising planning was all about that 10 years ago. Um, mapping techniques, um, more public support for housing development. Um, the claim being if you have a good quality consultation on development planning, then the individual plan comes to the table as a, as a clearer, clearer right, not in my experience. However, it is a, 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 a serious difficulty in trying to overcome uh, the sense of mindy, the sense of why here and not over there. Um, the, the appeal is if you have better quality public consultation, um, you, should, you should be overcoming all of that. Um, Technical problem about the definition of effective land supply. I think there is the private housing industry, as you know, uh, doesn't believe it. Um, really questions uh, what is effective and what isn't. And I fear that the planner very often is on the back foot on that, is in a very defensive posture. Um, and uh, yes, bringing on being part of this. Look, looking closely at the RICS recommendations and the, and the stuff in the Land Reform Review Group about CPO. There are parts of Scotland, Glasgow will claim that they know and liberally apply CPO, um, and other parts of Scotland have lost the habit altogether, fearing the consequences. Um, I'm very aware of how other European cities, when you see a big project, big complicated project, they generally wade in with the public interest in mind, compulsory purchase, get the land, do the land assembly, and then parcel it up accordingly. We've lost that discipline, I think, in creative ways. Um, finally, I, as, I, as, as I sort of got my hat to Mr. Neil, um, there is some reasonable progress. There is this commitment to 30,000 homes. By, by next year, um, we believe it will be delivered. Um, whether the right balance of housing will be delivered in that, I'm not sure. But it's not enough. That's the thing. I always believe that there is more to be done on understanding what is the enabling and then the supporting infrastructure that's required, and that the housing product and the housing value is very often rated in various ways pay for that stuff. And I've always believed it's totally perverse that the public subsidy that goes in to build an affordable house for social rent, a whole chunk of that sub public subsidy is creamed off for other public subsidy purposes. To build the road, to build the bridge, um, to contribute towards the school. All of which is needed, but it's a perverse way of financing. The private sector will say it's a tax, uh, and it's a tax too far. Um, I think we need a different approach to thinking that Section 75 is the primary way of financing infrastructure. Certainly not enabling, because you never get people paying up front. Certainly not the private sector these days. Um, and even in supporting infrastructure, the arguments rage about the school contribution. And that slows things down, the transport contribution in particular. Those things down. Our land assembly mechanisms, I don't think, are sophisticated enough. Um, uh, Newtown Development Corporation knew how to do it, and there was a financial model backing that up to deliver that very effectively. Whether you like the design or not, it's another matter. But the delivery mechanism was very effective. We need to be thinking about that again, I think. Um, there is, there is uh, within the 150 housing associations across Scotland. Um, financial capacity restrictions and serious limitations for many. Um, the, the government put a gauntlet down uh, in about 2010 to say uh, we want you to use your financial capacity.
capacity in the next period. And those who thought, yes, we'll continue to build, did just that. You only get to do that once, though. So that financial capacity is, is now fairly constrained. Um, we need different forms of finance to come to the table. Um, or classically, uh, in the hundred and so years that we've been building social housing, we've never done it, ever, without subsidy of one form or another. Um, lack of players. My point about um, attitude and behaviour of some of the larger developers, I worry about that, and we must try and encourage ways of getting more players in the 